I'm Seb Cadeneau. I'm head of international programs at the University of Kent. And as part of my role, I get to interact with many students from around the world and the UK and support them in learning additional skills that they require for university study. And one of the ones I wanted to focus on today is good academic practice. And we need to understand what good academic practice means um, and how we can learn to be better at our academic practice. And that's what I'll cover in this talk. So firstly, I'm going to talk about academic text. Um, by academic text, I mean any piece of text that is produced in the university context by scholars for scholars using a specific style or discourse and conventions. And that can be oral text, it can be written text, it can be written by researchers and lecturers and professors for publication, and it can be written or spoken by students in essays and reports and presentations. Now, I talked about good academic practice, and we need to understand that is linked to our academic integrity. And academic integrity, as our university defines it, is the attitude of approaching your academic work honestly. It's that idea of integrity and honesty by completing your own original work, attributing and acknowledging your sources when necessary, and not relying on dishonest means to gain advantage. And immediately, some people will be thinking, oh, students need to make sure that they are referencing, that they are acknowledging others. But it's not just about students. It's about all colleagues, whether it be staff or students, working honestly and ensuring that we are not relying on dishonest means to gain advantage. So in ensuring that we meet our commitment to academic integrity, we go back and look at what that academic practice needs to be when we are producing academic text. And I've already mentioned conventions and uh, referencing and uh, avoiding uh, using other people's work, making sure that our work is original. And that's what I want to tie up in this uh, presentation. So what is research? Because I've mentioned research a number of times. And why do we need to bring in research? And that's actually what I'm going to focus on. Uh, the research element is such an important part of academic work and of any scholarly endeavor. Anything we do within the context of university, whether it's as staff or students, needs to be backed by research. And so what is research, firstly? because we need to make sure we define it. Um, very simply, the Oxford English Dictionary talks us about a systematic investigation or inquiry aimed at contributing to knowledge. And so it's systematic, it's investigating, it's looking into things that we may already understand and know or things that we don't yet understand and know to discover more and understand more and then to contribute to knowledge of a theory or a topic, etc. And so we are trying to contribute through our demonstration of understanding through how we write or we speak. I've mentioned a number of times it can be in written form or in spoken form. How we contribute to the global knowledge and global understanding of that topic or that theory. And this is the purpose of research. And therefore, if you are doing research and you are writing or you are speaking and you have used research, you need to make sure that you are contributing yourself, contributing in a way to this research. And so that is such an important aspect that a lot of students can miss. How do we actually contribute as students? How do we demonstrate that we have understood and acknowledge that research and that we can use it to contribute to the development of our subject or the development of theories, etc. The dictionary continues and says it's the con careful consideration, observation, or study of a subject, and it uses no critical or scientific investigation. So we move on from research and we understand what academic integrity requires, our honesty, making sure that we are detailing what our own work is, but including that research from elsewhere. 
And importantly, if I look at my next slide, uh, good academic practice is defined, uh, again, at Kent as knowing and understanding the conventions and regulations of your academic institution and your academic discourse and the world you are studying and working in. It is also about finding your voice, and that's going to be uh, a main point throughout. How do we find our voice is very important, and we need to explore that in more detail, but mostly making sure that we use our own voice. This is why we ask people to present. This is why we ask people to write. And then drawing our own conclusions, providing our own suggestions, or making our own assessments and evaluations of a topic. That is what good academic practice is. It's about using what's there, understanding it, finding our voice, and being able to present our own conclusions, findings, evaluations based on what we have researched. And with good academic practice, of course, comes poor academic practice. And we often see this titled simply as plagiarism. And there's more to it than plagiarism, although it is one of the most common forms of this. Now, poor academic practice can be copying from others, whether it's their ideas or their words, um, without attribution. It can be uh, submitting work that has been produced by other people. It can be submitting work that actually we have previously submitted. That's one that uh, most colleagues are not fully aware of. Um, and then very simply, our uh, own website puts it as failing to adequately reference our sources. And what all of this is very clearly demonstrating is that poor academic practice is essentially not owning up if we've used somebody else's work or ideas. That's what it comes down to. And we want to acknowledge that that is not actually an easy process and that it's not because a student or perhaps a member of staff, but generally I'm going to focus on students maybe, submit a piece of work that is then flagged for poor academic practice or plagiarism, it doesn't mean that they intentionally set out to cheat. It can often very much be, and we see that research and the literature points to this, just a misunderstanding of what they're required to do, a misunderstanding of the conventions, a misunderstanding of why they're writing an essay or preparing a presentation in the first place. And I mentioned voice earlier, and that's what I want to come back to here. The reason why we give our students presentations to give or essays to write is not simply to see words repeated at us, perhaps from a previous lecture, or some research from a book repeated to us, or for our students simply to get a mark. The reason we ask students to produce this work is to showcase their understanding and their knowledge of a topic or a subject. It's to showcase their skills, their critical skills, their assessment of a situation. It is to showcase how they are able to carry out research that we've mentioned previously, looking for information, understanding it, and then how they can contribute to a discussion on that topic. That's why we set those pieces of work to be done. And in that form, we want to hear from the student. I'm not interested in reading a piece of work from my students which just repeats things from elsewhere because ultimately there's nothing from my student in there. I want to read this piece of work and understand how my student is thinking or what they have learned, what they have uh, been able to critically evaluate or assess or analyze within that piece of work. And so it's so important that that student's voice comes through, that it's not just repeated words, but it is truly their interpretation. So within the research process, what we find too often is that writers are going straight from uh, the research element and looking for sources straight to writing up or preparing their presentation. They are skipping key stages. They have looked at reading uh, around the subject or perhaps watching some form of documentary or something, they've found some information and then they might find a little bit more detailed information. They piece it all up and put together a piece of work to submit. And actually what they're missing out on are two key stages 
of that process. I'm sure we could detail more, but at least two key stages. Reading around the subjects, important, but not just straight away moving on to reading more detailed information. We need to pause and think about some research questions. When we write, we're responding to an idea. That might be someone who set a presentation title, an essay title. It might be that we are currently doing a piece of research and we're trying to publish our workings. And at that point, we need to make sure that what we're reading fits exactly with what we want to say in the end. And so once we've read a bit around the subject, we want to design some research questions, some very specific, meaningful questions that we're going to try to address as part of that presentation, that talk, that lecture, um, that publication or that essay. Then we can go and find the answers to our research questions in the more specific reading. And so it's such an important part to have a question to answer. If not, it can all be a little bit vague. And so we go and find the specific information. And then we make sure we make some notes. We organize our research. And yet again, this is a step that I've seen missed so many times where especially some of my students have gone from research and straight away, usually because they haven't got much time left before a submission date, go into writing and they produce this piece of work based on all of the publications that they have, maybe the tabs they've got open on their browser, and they are missing that organizational stage. They are missing the opportunity to work from notes. And invariably what happens there is that we end up with the student's voice or the writer's voice being lost. It is lost amongst all of this other research, maybe good research, that they have brought in. And they're not able to showcase their understanding, their suggestions, their assessments, their evaluations. And so really they're holding themselves back in missing that step because they're then not giving themselves the opportunity to produce very good work, firstly, but actually gain the marks that they deserve for their research because they're not able to showcase it well. Now, why do we bring that research in? That's the other option. If I can't really bring in all the research well because I'm not sure what the, uh, the conventions are or I'm not sure of how to do it very well, then why don't I just write a form a stream of consciousness where I just give all of my ideas? That's another option. And the problem with that is that we're missing out on that research. One, obviously, most students would be marked on research. And if you want to publish a paper as an academic, then, of course, you will need to produce the research as part of that paper. But two, we don't just research in order for marks or in order to get published. It is part of this academic integrity in terms of honesty as to where the core ideas come from. It is also to ensure that our writing or our presentations, our lecture, our publications are less biased, that they are more objective, essentially. They're more reliable. It's not just me saying this. It's also other people. They're more informed. They demonstrate that we're not just basing this on emotion, um, but on a thought process, too. They will usually tend to be more critical and more balanced. And essentially, all of these things together, we could nearly qualify this as a sort of match or a fight where instead of just little me giving my viewpoint, it is now me plus all of these authors that I've researched. And that gives your piece of work a lot more weight. And that's where we want the voice, we want the me, but we also want it to be backed by research. And we want that balance. That's what we're always looking for. And so when we talk about uh, good academic practice, we're looking actually for balance between someone using their own voice and someone using research appropriately. So what can we actually do to help our students progress in this area and understand better what good academic practice is and how to avoid poor academic practice. So a suggested approach and the approach we use in our department, which can be transferred to other subject areas, is recognizing and discussing with our students 
the challenges of good and poor academic practice. It's acknowledging that whatever educational cultural background you have, whether it be in the UK or from elsewhere in the world, that the, pr the production of academic text prior to joining university might have been a very different process to the one you're now being asked to follow. That you may not have been asked to use all the conventions that we do in UK higher education and that you need to adapt to that. But we also need to acknowledge that we still have a duty to all other students and to the university and we need to uphold the rules and the conventions and the regulations. But we need to recognise that our students also need training. And so where students may get it wrong the first time and where traditionally there would be strong penalties, are we able to introduce opportunities for learning? Can we ask our students to perhaps correct their work and resubmit their work? I appreciate that may not work in every single subject area or every single level and type of assessment, but can we meet each error with a learning opportunity? And with that, can we make sure that we give our students the required training to ensure they understand all of the challenges around good and poor academic practice, but also understand any challenges that they may face personally and to make sure that they're able to overcome these. Just to give us an example of what this might look like in practice, in our department, we have looked at our poor academic practice cases over the past few years and analyzed the data as you'll see on this last slide. Just over three quarters of students who've been referred for poor academic practice have found that to be their first instance. So uh, a flag is put up to the student to say, you haven't performed as well as you could here. And firstly, we need to meet, we need to discuss, we need to go through your assessment with you. And then you may need to resubmit or rewrite your essay, depending on the severity of the poor academic practice. There's also just under a quarter of students who still got that opportunity to discuss their work because some errors were flagged, but did not need to resubmit or rewrite their essay. But all students, regardless of whether they had to resubmit or not, met with somebody in the team to go through their work, what the errors were, and how to avoid them in future. And this is about recognizing the challenges and putting in the training required for those students. Now, that seems to work well in that fewer than half of those students see a second instance of poor academic practice flagged against them. And those students then are even less likely to come to a third instance. So overall, what we see is that by offering students learning opportunities when they're picked up for poor academic practice, we can try to stop that early on. We can try to make sure that our students have the opportunity to change their practice from poor to good. We can make sure that our students have the opportunity to discuss the challenges around this piece of work or future pieces of work and understand how to fit into the academic conventions and that academic integrity we talked about at the beginning. So overall, we need to remember that good academic practice is knowing and understanding the conventions that are used in academic text, whether it be spoken or writing. And we need to make sure that our students are trained appropriately and that we as members of staff are models in academic integrity and that we showcase what it means to be part of an academic community. We also want to make sure that our students are able to find their voice. Like we, as writers or speakers, will ensure that we bring in research, we bring in what has been done before, and we acknowledge it, and we use our conventions, but that we also add our own flavor to it, that we add our own voice, that it is both balance of our own voice and our research. And we need to encourage that in our students to make sure that they're not just giving us a stream of consciousness with no research grounding, but also avoiding just repeating a lot of research 
without really ever showcasing their interpretation, their suggestions, their assessment of a theory, topic, etc. And we need to focus on the fact that good academic practice is about drawing our own conclusions, providing our own voice throughout. Thank you.